Welcome, everybody, and uh, thanks for being with us. And today is an exciting day because we have a guy with us who has done more, I think, than anybody else in our country to popularize science, uh, to make kids aware that science is not only important, but it is fun, and that actually reading and thinking is a good thing. So, Bill Nye, welcome very much. And Thank I you, Senator. Wow, this is... This is great. Okay, thanks so much for all that you've done. All right, let's cut right to it. How's that? Uh, we have a president of the United States who thinks that climate change is a hoax emanating from China. We have a new administrator of the EPA, somebody I strongly opposed, who is in the process of dismembering uh, environmental protection regulations in this country. What are the short and long-term implications of uh, a president who has that view. So let me say that the long-term implications are potentially catastrophic. And everybody, you can hate me, you can hate everything. I understand that. But the problem is the speed at which the world is warming and the climate is changing. It's not that the climate is changing. It's the rate. Half the people in the world live near coastlines. As the ocean gets a tiny bit warmer, it gets a tiny bit bigger, but the ocean is big and a tiny bit is huge. So uh, it is to be hoped that we can head this off. Now, when you say, uh, Senator, what the president believes, I, I often, he, is it true that he contradicts himself? Every other so, minute, so. So it is reasonable to me that if we can show an economic benefit to turning things around, we could turn things around. And the, the example I hearken to all the time, everybody, is the Solutions Project. And the Solutions Project is a group of civil engineers who have done an analysis that shows we could power the entire U.S. renewably right now if we just decided to do it. And uh, by that I mean we'd have wind turbines, solar panels, some geothermal energy, some tidal energy. And if we exploited all these things aggressively and reconfigured our electric grid uh, a little bit, we could run the whole place. And so here's the thing about it that I find intriguing and important is these would be U.S. jobs. Right. Even if the wind turbine blades are designed in Sweden or Finland or Denmark, you have to put them up, you have to erect the turbines here and these are going to be no, U.S. No question jobs. about it. So if we, here's what I'm saying. Yeah. If we can get people on that side of this issue to look at it in just even the medium term, they will see that uh, From an economic huge, point of view. There's a huge opportunity here. But before you even get there, and, and I absolutely agree with you, I have colleagues right here in the United States Senate who say, well, you know, yeah, it looks like it is the earth is getting a little bit warmer, but you know, be, these, these things have always gone on and you know, it's, we have hot spells and we got cold spells. Uh, and, and the science really is not clear. There are always two sides of the story. No, the Tell me why is, they are wrong. Well, the science is settled, everybody. Sorry, it's 97% yeah, I watch of Fox television, they don't agree. Uh, so that's the one thing that really is hard for me about Fox News is the denial of climate change in science. The, the other stuff, many of the other things they assert are troubling, but that one is the one that just crosses the line for me. And furthermore, I'm pretty sure that the anchors who present that, they're no better, and they're just going along with right, So the, let me ask you a, so, a question, but I please. think most people know the answer. Fossil fuel industry, incredibly powerful. Yeah. Uh, they have ads on television every five minutes. Uh, they make a lot of campaign contributions. Yeah, that's they a big have thing. Huge amount of political influence. What type? What impact does that influence have on the whole debate over climate change? Well, that's what I say all the time: that climate change deniers, who apparently no longer want to be called deniers, they want to be called extreme skeptics. Uh, they uh, have been able to introduce the idea that plus or minus. 2%, what have you, from a scientific standpoint, is the same as plus or minus 100%. And that's wrong. So in other words, when people try to predict the temperature 10 years or 50 years hence, they might be off a tenth of a degree Celsius. But that doesn't mean they're wrong. It means that there's a little scientific uncertainty. It's not the same as uncertainty about the whole thing. And it's ironic or amazing 
that they've hired the same people who were in denial about cigarette and cancer. That, that was the question I was going to ask you. It's just are, are we seeing Those a guys rerun are still of the whole? Around. <laughs> are we seeing a rerun of the whole denial of tobacco causes cancer? Right yeah, now? yeah. But this is an analogy uh, that you can take exception to analogies. The, the facts, the scientific facts are overwhelming. So here's what I'm saying, Senator, is that because people are so passionate about it, I think when they see the light, like who is the most, who is the strongest environmentalist? The guy who just built his log cabin. Right? Who is the strongest anti-smoker? The guy who just managed to quit. Mm -hmm. So I, if from an optimistic point of view, I think if we can get these people to just look at the world a little differently, they will be on the side of domestically produced renewable electricity in a very quick, short order. Bill, I want to get to what America will look like when we transform our energy system, move aggressively to energy efficiency. But before I do that, let me ask you kind of the frightening question. What happens if we don't do that? Oh, what happens man. to my kids and my grandchildren? Well, yeah, your grandkids. What kind of planet are they going to inherit if we don't well, here's, act here's aggressively? What's going to happen? In the developed world where we are, we will build seawalls. You know, the, the big U in Manhattan, they're building a system of seawalls and parks to avoid the catastrophic effects of Hurricane Sandy. And you can say, well, Hurricane Sandy came and went, everything's cool. But no, the economic cost, billions of dollars in the city of New York, which rippled around the world because New York is, New York really is a world city. And when it has a financial trouble, the whole world does. So we can do those sort of seawall uh, mitigation projects here in the developed world. But in the developing world, it's much more difficult. People are going to move and be displaced. And something, a scenario that I've imagined uh, that seems very reasonable, and people in like the ninth ward of New Orleans, as the ocean comes in, they're going to leave. They're just going to leave, and they're going to default on their mortgages, and there's going to be all this infrastructure, copper wiring and plumbing and all the stuff that's just going to be sitting there. And it's but going to be But obviously really it's not just the United States. It's going to be developing countries all over the world. Yeah. Millions of people being forced to migrate. Yeah, my, and where are they going to go and what are they going to eat? And there's going to be conflict and there's, it's just, we could avoid all this if we just got to work right now. And what about drought and floods and stuff like that? Well, that's that? it. So there are people who make a very strong argument to me. These are climate scientists. <coughs> that uh, the, a lot of the um, unrest in the Middle East is uh, displaced young men who don't want to work the family farm anymore because the family farm isn't doing as well as it used to because rain pattern, rainfall patterns have changed. They go to the big cities, they can't get jobs, they get disenfranchised, and then they get involved in essentially terrorist operations. Now this. You can bite my head off about this, but it's a very reasonable hypothesis, and I've seen no evidence that it's not reasonable. So everybody, I say all the time, Senator, we have to be optimistic. We have to get to work. And I just to the deniers out there, or the extreme skeptics, I want you to think about what's called cognitive dissonance. Do you remember cognitive dissonance? Good liberal arts education thing. This is a psychology theory that you can run tests and show that it's true. The guy who really suffered from cognitive dissonance is the fox and his grapes. So he can't get to the grapes. The fox is trying to get to the grapes. He can't get them. So he says the grapes must be sour. And he says that to him or she, to herself, so that she will not have this conflict in her mind as a vixen, as a fox, a woman, a female fox. Uh, she says this so that she can be at peace. So I submit to you, climate deniers, that what you're doing is instead of accepting that climate is changing, you're denying the evidence, and along with that, you're dismissing the authorities. All right, how do you respond? I mean, and that's where I think you come in, is how can you, how can you say the authorities on climate change aren't authorities? I but, sit on a committee. I sit on the Energy Committee. I sit on the Environmental Committee. I sit right across... Uh, the aisle from guys who say, mm, yeah, it's getting a little bit warm, but it's, it's always been like that. There really is no proof that human activity uh, and has caused uh, climate change. So, so here's what we say. There's overwhelming proof. 
proof isn't even the word. It's overwhelming evidence. And so uh, <clears throat> what I believe you're doing on the other side is you're suffering from this magic thing, magical thing called the backfire effect. When you see evidence that conflicts with your worldview, you just double down on denying it. And we all do it. 